Hi and welcome to this pre-recorded webinar from the American Mathematical Society. Today we are going to talk about AMS Math Viewer, the interactive dual panel reading experience for AMS journal content. Before we get started, let me give you a quick outline over what we're going to talk about today. First, I'll talk a little bit about the history of Math Viewer and how the AMS started this project. Then we will move to a practical life example. In that example, we'll talk about the basic layout, the various components that make up the reading experience, and then we will dive a little bit deeper into more technical aspects, such as accessibility features that we provide. All right, let's get started. MathViewer is actually a surprisingly old project. The AMS started experimenting with full-text HTML for articles and books roughly 10 years ago, creating several prototypes along the way. The goal was to explore how the specifics of AMS content could be presented well on the medium that is the web, as opposed to traditional print and PDF presentation. One important stage was a project called AMS Lens created with Substance.io, a development team out of Austria. Substance had famously created the Lens platform for the open access publisher eLife. We teamed up with them to build several prototypes for AMS content. These prototypes provided an inspiration for the development of MathViewer, which the AMS ultimately undertook independently. MathViewer first rolled out to select journals in 2017 and is steadily expanding to all AMS journals. The design of MathViewer is entirely focused on leveraging the web's particular character as a medium. For us, this includes leveraging how we can provide a rich document structure for a great reading experience, ensuring that we don't break the universal access that the web can provide to all readers. As a result, we work to ensure that we have an adaptable display and that dynamic interaction is possible. But all of it is done for the ease of the reader, to interact with and to process the content we provide. The usability goals here are not limited to just traditional long-form reading of scholarly content, but also taking care of the more ephemeral uses of journal article content. We realized that for long-form reading, most people tend to rely on a printed product or maybe a PDF on a large screen. But there are additional use cases that we wanted to address where these media fall a bit short. So a typical example might be the kind of behavior that a researcher or a student shows when they want to quickly browse a new publication, say during a literature review or looking up a specific item from a reference in another paper that is a specific theorem or a definition or an otherwise important part. In those scenarios, you often fall short when you encounter a PDF because it is difficult to find the correct place that you need to read and also reference again and again, especially if you are on the go, whether it's catching up on new publications during your commute or sitting in a classroom discussing mathematics, or for that matter, in a coffee shop needing to look something up quickly. These are the kinds of additional use cases where we see the medium of the web shine because it, is, it gives very fast, quick and easy access. And at the same time, it provides a different way of using content enabling a different use more easily than traditional print-based media. So, from here on out, let's jump over to a real use case. Let me switch to this tab. Here we are on the very first volume of Proceedings of the American Mathematical Society Series B, which is in fact where the development of MathViewer began. Let's open the page for this article titled The Disproof of a Conjecture by Rademacher on Partial Fractions. 
On the abstract page, you will find links to both HTML and PDF. The HTML link will lead us to the Math Viewer version of this article. Let's follow the link. And here we are. The immediate thing that is observable, either visually or in fact non-visually, is that the document has a core design of a simple dual panel layout. On one side, we have what we call the primary panel. It has the main article content. On the other side, we have the secondary panels, which are in fact changeable. They provide various types of content, in particular cross-referenced parts, as well as other information. We will go through these panels one by one, but you will hopefully quickly find that this is a very stable setup. We do not want to make it even more complicated for people to interact with. So we have a very fixed structure that is reliable, in particular when it comes to users of assistive technologies. We ensure that not just the visual design is easily accessed, but also the non-visual presentation. For example, we make good use of landmarks that are easy to reach for users of assistive technology. We'll get into more details on that later. Visually, we essentially have two modes. We have the landscape mode that you would currently see on your screen. That is on the left, main, the main article panel content, and on the right, the secondary panel content. If you are on a small screen, let me overlay an example. Then you would actually see a vertical stack with the main article panel on top and the secondary panel on the bottom. This simply addresses the practical need that frequently people read on portrait devices, whether it's a phone in your pocket or the tablet in your bag. It is a very frequent use case and we want to leverage the available space in the most efficient fashion. At the top of our dual panel design, you find the navigation. This gives you access to the main parts of this display. The navigation links lead you to this primary and secondary panels. In this example, we have all possible secondary panels. We start with a link to the AMS homepage, then a hidden skip link to the main article content. Next, we have links to the secondary panels, contents, figures, mathematics, references, article information, and settings. We will go through these individually to give you an idea how they fit together. All right, let's dive into the main article panel. I'm currently highlighting on the left of the screen. Here is where the article's main body of text can be found. The layout that we're using is trying to leverage both the traditions of print and web design to the benefit of the reader. Most importantly, of course, is the base typography. We're using the Stix2 fonts developed by the Stipub Committee, which of course the American Mathematical Society has been a leading member of. This gives us a very clear and modern typography that still provides us with the widest possible range of character support. Nevertheless, we immediately deviate from print traditions and choose a visual rhythm that is more oriented around web traditions because ultimately this is the medium we are operating in. Therefore, section headings, figure titles, theorem titles, etc. are in fact easier to spot because they are much more prominent and larger than they would appear in a print product. In the end, the web is an infinite canvas and we should make use of that and adapt to that. These stronger visual cues identify the core pieces quickly. This helps readers orient themselves within the publication, even when click quickly browsing through the main article content. Of course, the core typography nevertheless remains solid and 
focused on enabling dedicated reading. We provide a little bit of additional visual cues around cross-references to bibliographies, figures, mathematical fragments, and we'll get into more details there. These cues are not just done visually, but of course also non-visually. For example, we enhance cross-references so readers can discern the type of referenced items before activating a link. Last, but very much not least, we leverage MathJax for high-quality formula layout on the web. MathJax continues to be the gold standard for this, and again, it is a project that the AMS has been a leading partner of ever since its inception. We'll get into more detail on formula layout later, but here we can identify another example where we deviate from print traditions. When in print, you would generally center display equations. On the web, we choose a left alignment. This adjusts for the reading behavior of web content, which is consistently different from print. After all, we need to adapt to the way people read on the web and not the other way around. Next, let's dive into the secondary panels. Again, I'm going to highlight the active one. In this setup, this is on the right. As mentioned earlier, secondary panels appear on the right for large or landscape browser windows and at the bottom for small vertical browser windows. As the name implies, secondary panels provide access to secondary content. Primarily, this means reference contents, but also additional information. The main goal of this design is to help assist the reader by providing a stabilization point so that they can view content side by side as they see fit. And this side-by-side -side viewing is not just aided visually, but of course also non-visually, as we'll discuss in a minute. Initially, the secondary panel will show the table of contents. You'll find this is possibly a bit different from what you might expect in a print publication. In fact, most of the AMS journals do not come with a table of contents on the article level. We go with one here because we realize that the web in its reflowable form, lacks the kind of cues that a fixed sized print page can yield. So we need to help people orient themselves by providing more assistive tooling, and a table of contents is a very classical and standard way for doing so. We nevertheless give it a twist and actually include important enunciations in the list. So alongside the first and second level section titles, theorems, Lemeter, etc., are also included here. This helps readers to orient themselves just as they would with any other table of contents, making the shortcuts available side by side, however, avoids needing to scroll back to the top of an article or any other confusing behavior that might move the reader out of their current area of focus. In addition, you might notice visually when I'm scrolling like this, there are certain highlights appearing in the table of contents. This is usually called a scroll spy. It indicates whereabouts in the document you are by highlighting the corresponding item in the table of contents. As usual, this is not just done visually. There are equivalent non-visual cues in the table of contents that help readers who are not able to see or not see well the other side of the math viewers dual panel. This way, they can still tell from the table of contents in which position they are in the main article. For example, when reading a paper with another person or in a group. The next secondary panel is usually, but not always, the figure panel. You can access it directly or via the navigational control at the beginning of the document, or it will open up from any link to a figure element. Let me find one and in the main article. Let's see, here's one to figure three. 
and click on it. The links for figures have a visual cue that is a reddish color background, in this case for figure four, uh, for figure three. You might see the panel changes to reveal the figure panel, and you can view the figure without changing the position in the primary panel. Now, figure is a vague term. It includes graphical figures like this one, but also tables and ultimately anything that the authors have deemed to be figure-like. So you might find a code listing here or a bit of pseudocode depending on the content. All of this is of course up to the author and how they organized their content. Another thing you might notice is that we additionally provide so-called backlinks. Let me highlight them in the figure panel right now. Right there. These backlinks help readers return to the previous positions, but also know what other positions a certain fragment like this figure is actually being referenced at. Let me find one that has multiple backlinks like figure four in this article. Again, you will see a visual cue. Let me find a link to figure four or maybe figure one. That's not good. Here we have one. Here is a link. I've scrolled to a position of a link to figure four. We'll fo follow it. And now you might see the visual cue, much like in the scroll spy feature of the table of contents, one of the backlinks is highlighted to indicate that is the currently active backlink. That is the link from which we came to the panel. Again, this is also done non-visually. So for example, a screen reader user might get a short announcement that this is the currently active backlink. That way, readers know which link to click if they want to return to the position they accessed the figure from. Backlinks are important because a dual panel view can be disorienting. After all, it's really a kind of anti-pattern to click on a link and nothing happens at the position of the link. Backlinks help provide readers with orientation here. We do believe it's overall a higher value to the readers to have a dual panel reading experience combined with these robust controls. Readers can always return using backlinks and at the same time we use very strict and reliable patterns for accessing the secondary panels. This way, readers, for example with a screen magnifier, can reliably find the position of the figure after clicking on a link in the main article content instead of being disoriented by the fact that the position they clicked on has not changed. All of these are examples of the considerations that come into play and are emblematic of our design choices throughout MathViewer. The next secondary panel you'll find in most articles, and that is the mathematics panel. Let's find a suitable link, say this one, in the main article content and activate it. The links have a visual cue that is a bluish background and they lead us to the panel that is dedicated to mathy content. In a mathematical article, you would typically find these kinds of content fragments and that of course means you will find them in AMS publications. This panel was one of the driving features to start with our own approach to presenting HTML because mathematical fragments are somewhat unusual, but they are, of course, integral to the kinds of publications that the AMS provides. So we have a dedicated place for cross-referenced mathematical content. Primarily, this means equations and enunciations, that is, lemmata, theorems, definitions, propositions, etc. No matter how the authors have decided to name or organize them, if such an item is referenced in the main article content, then we make them available in the secondary panel to simplify looking them up for reference. Again, 
this is really a necessity. Somebody reading a printed publication might simply organize the different paper pages. They might pull them apart, have multiple pages side by side, and all of this gives them a much easier physical recollection of where things are and a much easier time looking something up that came earlier in a publication. On the web, that is a challenge, and we face that challenge by providing additional means and, of course, providing them in a way that is accessible to all readers. Next comes the References panel. This is, as you would expect, where you find the bibliography. Let's find a bibliographic reference. The visual cue is a yellowish background. Here we are, and activate this one to citation four. You will find that this is the same behavior we're having here. Of course, there is no duplication of content as we have, say, in the math panel. Instead, we have the bibliographic items and we still have the same rich presentation overall. It is more visually prominent, again, because we are in a different medium than we are in print. On the web, we have the space presented dynamically, and it is easier to find things that way in this more dynamic medium. At the same time, you still get all the goodness that you would expect on the web. You will get direct links to DOIs, you'll get links to reviews on MathSignet, when they're available and of course you can even grab some AMS ref data let me click on this for your own bibliographic and citation needs so all of these things are provided right there and easy to get to and of course again we have backlinks this is actually a perfect example where backlinks are not just a nice accessibility feature but it is a universally interesting feature as it turned out, early testers found it very interesting to see which items in the bibliography were referenced many times across a paper. And where, for example, if they were referenced only in the introduction, or maybe referenced just in the conclusion, or in a particular section, or a particular proof. So this seems to appear useful to all people, and of course, providing a great benefit for non-visual users and users of assistive technologies to orient themselves. Next, we have the article information panel. This is usually only accessible by the navigation menu. Let me activate that link. Here, we cover all the article metadata needs. So you'll find math subject classification data, including, of course, the proper links to the various locations. You'll find the keywords, contributor information, and notes that are appropriate, and of course the publication history and copyright information, in particular for an open access paper like this one. Finally, you'll find metadata, DOIs, AMS ref data for the article itself. This content naturally depends on each individual article. Some of this information might not be available or appropriate for any particular journal or article. Finally, at the very end of the navigation menu, you'll find a settings tab. Let me activate this here. It is only accessible by the navigation. The settings leads us straight into the second part of this webinar as it leads a bit deeper into the accessibility features of MathViewer. The settings allow readers to change various features of the display. We try to follow the design philosophy to only add things you could do otherwise too. So this is more a convenience or maybe a strengthening of the tools that readers might already have at their disposal. Take the first setting to change the font size. Here you can increase or decrease the font size as you like. Let me try this, click a few times and reset it at the end. Well, that's not a good example of a reset, so let's <laughs> reset it again. Here you can increase and decrease, but you can also, via say the browser menu, zoom in and still get the additional benefit 
of changing it the other way around. So I'm going to make the font smaller with the settings panel and then increase the zoom. They do not get in each other's way. They interact nicely no matter how we want to do this. These things do not block each other but work together hand in hand so that readers can optimize the display to whatever needs they have. All right, I've reset all my zoom levels so that we can continue in the base setup. Similarly, you can resize the article panel. I'll de demonstrate that now. Let me increase it a little to give it more space. Maybe reset it tiny, make it a little bit tinier because we want it to take less space and reset it again. Now, of course, the main article panel has a maximum width because otherwise lines get too long and become unreadable. But in a situation where you have a smaller browser window available, say on a slightly smaller screen, you may want to tweak this a, a little to whatever you need. And it's hopefully easy to do via the settings panel. Next, we have dark and light mode settings. Initially, Math Viewer will follow the browser settings. So if you are a reader with a device set to use dark mode, for example, then that will automatically occur. But if you want to manually overwrite that to be in light mode again, just because it works better for you here, then you can do that too. And you can always revert to the browser defaults. Say if these come from the operating system settings, like you might find on a mobile device, a tablet, where they might automatically switch in the mornings and evenings. All of these just work in your environments and in your, for your needs. Let me try this as well, so we can change to a dark theme. You'll see the colors changing, and we can go back to the browser default. And of course, the light color theme would just be the default of this browser as well. Of course, all of these settings persist across visits and across articles you read, and you can clear your settings like any other browser data. The last piece of the settings panel revolves around formula layout and enriching the display of equations. But before we try this out, let me stack back a little and talk about what accessibility means for Math Viewer. In the design, accessibility was one of the founding principles why we went on this adventure to build Math Viewer eight years ago. Ultimately, accessibility lies at the heart of a good reading experience. And that is a reading experience for all readers. Ultimately, accessibility is just readability and usability. That's all it is in this context. But of course, just is not a small word here. Now, on a formal level, Math Viewer aims to provide WCAG 2.2 AA level compliant presentation. That is, of course, the legal minimum you would expect, so you shouldn't expect anything less. At the same time, that's necessary, but certainly not sufficient for a good display. As Eric Eggard, a specialist on web accessibility, once put it, if there's a regulation on the maximum amount of lead in water, then nobody would think, well, that's the optimal level of lead in water. So this is not what we want to do. WCAG for us is the minimum. And sometimes we have to admit that we might fail for reasons that are outside of our control, but it's still just the minimum. The very least we can do is try to be much better than that and actually create a highly usable reading experience for everyone who wants to read our content. As a result of this, we realize we are not at an end point at any given moment. We continuously revise and extend the design and the functionality of Math Viewer so that we can enhance the experience for everyone reading an article this way. This includes users of assistive technologies, but also everybody else. 
As we've seen again and again, everybody benefits from a more accessible and inclusive design. Of course, mathematical content is particularly challenging in this context. Scholarly content and high-level research, as we see in AMS publications, even more so. But that will not stop us from trying to do our very best. We do face limitations. As we already mentioned, this is simply in the nature of converting author-generated content we, that we do not have full control over and that we cannot randomly change because that would go against the interests of the author and also the reader, because they of course want to read what an author intended to be written. Nevertheless, our continuing efforts allow us to support more and more types of content in an accessible manner, without getting stuck in doing the most general or theoretically possible solutions. We are very much focused on incremental improvements to this tool and the tool chain that stands behind it, so we can make it better every day for every reader. This brings us back to this last section of the settings panels. One of the biggest challenges of accessibility of a mathematical publication lies naturally in the formula layout that is present. Now, in short, this last group of settings allows readers to enable speech synthesis and subtitling while exploring formula layout. These features are not actually meant directly or primarily for users of assistive technologies. Instead, readers using AT will automatically get this rich information with their preferred tools. However, it is often useful for readers to be able to actually get this additional information from the rich markup. In technical terms, we combine MathJax and its sister project Speechful Engine in a fairly unique way to create a robust, explorable formula layout. In particular, we provide both text and Braille descriptions in the document. These descriptions will always work. They are merely dynamically enhanced whenever we can to provide an even richer experience for the reader. This approach gives us the opportunity to provide a very reliable and robust baseline while expanding on that baseline in a way that works with most browsers and assistive technologies. These include full-on screen readers like NVDA, JAWS, VoiceOver, or Orca, but also works with less complex assistive technologies such as read aloud tools that are available in many other forms for users of varying degrees of assistive needs. The exploration method we provide for formula layout becomes available when such an expression is in focus. Let's move focus to an expression by clicking on it. Let me pick this one here. You'll find there's a visual indicator telling readers that they can now interact with this expression. Non-visually, we use a tree pattern which similarly indicates interactivity. Now with the subtitle setting, we can make that non-visual description visible as subtitles. Let me activate it and go back to the expression. With the speech synthesis setting, we can hear these descriptions. Again, the speech synthesis is not meant for screen reader users because a screen reader will generate the same audio audio, so this feature would lead to duplicate audio rendering. In other words, if you use a screen reader, then you probably don't want to activate this, as it is also as is also noted in the text of the settings panel. All right, let's activate speech synthesis and go back to the expression to hear what the output might sound like. C5 left parenthesis upper end right parenthesis colon equals minus start root upper end end root. All right. For the time being, to avoid too much noise in the audio, let's disable speech synthesis and rely on the subtitling feature. Let's look at exploration next. If you saw, the subtitle can be very long. Let's activate it again. 
This reflects actually the robust behavior that we mentioned earlier. There's always a full description available. Yet, that's not always ideal. Which is why exploration with arrow keys is available to get more granular pieces inside the expression. Let's press the down arrow key. This takes us to a substructure of the expression. Still a pretty long expression. Let me press down arrow again. Now we are in a short expression. Then we can hit the right arrow key to navigate through this expression. Clicking right, clicking right. And we come to the end of this substructure. And if I hit right arrow again, I won't actually move forward. Instead, I can move up with the up arrow key to the parent level and then continue moving right on that upper level again. Now activating the right arrow key and again the right arrow key leads me to this place and trying again I notice that I'm not getting any further in the expression. This way we can step through an equation piece by piece as we need. Now what you may have seen visually and may have heard in the speech synthesis if you try it out that is the same description that a screen reader user would hear through, though they might have more options, of course, for synthetic voices. Now, a reader using a Braille display would get a similar kind of granular exploration, but using Braille-specific descriptions. This is useful because even on a refreshable Braille display, very lengthy expressions can be too long. In terms of technical specifics of these textual descriptions, we use Speech Rule Engine's MathSpeak implementation as the primary textual description, that is what was displayed as a subtitle just now. In parallel, we leverage Speech Rule Engine's Nemeth Braille implementation to provide Braille descriptions. For this combined approach, we are using a fairly new feature of the web, which is not that widely supported in screen readers yet, but for example, Apple's VoiceOver already supports it. This is an example how the AMS is supportive of the web standardization process and tries to lead the way by making sure that such standards are widely used and not just in the theory of some specification. On a final note, there is another useful piece for power users, of which there are quite a few in this space. You can in fact get the source of the tech of the expression from the page. We'll get back to that later. I mention it here because we hope to expose the text source as an explorable description in the future. Again, our friends at MathJax have created wonderful new tools that will allow us to create such explorable text descriptions. That's important because whereas MathSpeak and Nemeth Braille are primarily used in the English speaking world, Tech is a format that is used in other parts of the world and ultimately the lingua franca of mathematical writing. So while it makes sense to default to MathSpeak and Nemeth, after all, AMS content is largely in English, providing additional options is important to us. To wrap up this webinar, let's talk a little bit about some technical aspects around what MathViewer does. Another key design consideration has been that we work entirely with progressive enhancements and we thereby ensure that when something falls over, whether it's because the network conditions are poor, whether it's because we've made a mistake, whether it's because something else unexpected happened, in whatever situation, the reading experience may degrade, but the, reading, the experience remains robust and works in as many scenarios as possible. In other words, when something fails, it fails gracefully. This way, the core experience remains ideal relative to whatever conditions we find ourselves in. For example, while MathViewer already uses only very little JavaScript, even if that JavaScript fails, you might have a hard time noticing at first. That is, you would still have all the content and design available to you and everything would generally work the same way. But, for example, 
instead of having nice separate secondary panels, you would just get a single long secondary panel with different sections. For another example, while interactive exploration of formula layout might fail, the text and braille descriptions would still be available. Enabling this kind of robust behavior is actually easy to do nowadays, and of course that's very important to us. We not only provide a good reading experience, but a very robust one. Another part of that is our attitude to provide offline first display. Once you've visited an article, even if you go offline, you will still get the full article when you revisit the URL. In fact, the page will probably load faster than the first time around. This kind of offline first approach commonly falls under the umbrella term of progressive web apps. And in fact, every article is an individual progressive web app, so readers can effectively install Math Viewer articles. This offers certain benefits. For example, on mobile devices, this creates affordances such as a dedicated app icon or just that the paper is a, you know, in a custom full screen display uh, that the mobile device provides for progressive web apps. All of this makes life easier when you're looking to access an article while offline and just generally. We add these kind of details because while we don't want to replicate a print experience, there are aspects that are well worth preserving. And just with, as with print, you should be, expect to be able to read while offline. A final little gem. We mentioned already that there is some hidden tech code in the article. This is actually very easy to access. If you copy and paste text that includes an equation, then you will actually find that there's tech code in place of the formula layout when you paste the contents. So let me try to select some text with some equations. Now I'm going to copy this text and let me pull up a text editor and paste the text. You will find that in the text content you will have typical LaTeX expressions for the formula layout from the article. This is another one of those small features where we leverage the best of what we have. We have the tech sources, we have the modern web platform, and we combine them to make it easy for people to reuse the content that they read. All right, I hope that gave you a good first impression of what MathViewer is all about, including a good overview over the general design, its robustness, and the high quality of its display and layout, as well as some hidden gems. Thank you again for taking the time to watch this and have a great day.